Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. And this is on CT of the small bowel and mesentery, focusing on inflammatory bowel disease. And this is a talk I put together for the Penn meeting in Martha's Vineyard this summer. So I thought I would share it with you now. And in terms of protocols, our protocols are pretty simple. We're uh, basically giving the patient oral contrast, which is typically a neutral contrast agent, which is water. Um, we will always use IV contrast material, ideally Omnipeg 350 or Visi 320, uh, injecting at five cc's a second. We will give the patient oral contrast material, and typically we're talking about giving usually about 1,000 cc's. Occasionally we use volumen, though I've never been all that impressed by volumen, and so water tends to be the uh, contrast agent of choice. In select cases, for example, patients where you can't give IV contrast, cases where you're looking for perforation or fistulization, then positive contrast, and in those cases, Omni 350 solution works very nicely. When we do dedicated small bowel studies, we are doing dual phase imaging. I will agree that you don't always need dual phase imaging, but for a lot of the dedicated studies, particularly in complex cases, it is critical. We typically do not do non-contrast scans. Uh, we rarely do non-contrast scans. If you ask me when do we do non-contrast scans, I'll say typically in the abdomen for stone protocol, which means non-contrast only, or for cases with hematuria where we're going to look at the kidneys and we want to look for any high-density renal cysts. And rarely we'll do delayed phase imaging, and the word rarely should be noted. We tend to use thin sections, 0.75 millimeters every 0.5. That's our protocol. We also reconstruct the three millimeter intervals. And the three millimeter intervals with three millimeter thick sections are done for just a routine quick screening. The other images are used for the multiplanar reconstructions as well as the 3D mapping. When you think about the small bowel, you gotta think about the bowel, the mesentery, and the vessels. Each of those can be involved by specific processes, but often a single process will involve two or three of these components. And in thinking about all of them, you really can often reach the right diagnosis. If you don't think about all of them, you will often make significant error. We talk about the imaging tools, and we like to look at things in a volume, so we're using axial, multiplanar, and 3D images. Occasionally curved planar, though not very commonly in routine abdomen work, though we do it with vascular work. We tend to like volume rendering, but volume rendering and MIP are both used in terms of image analysis. When we talk about cases, and just an example, here's a patient with Crohn's disease. You see thick and small bowel. You see thick and right colon, some prominent vessels. But when you put it in the coronal view, you really understand the extent of involvement of the TI to cecum. You see the areas of stricture. When you put it in MIP, you see the vessels better. You see the prominent vasa recta, which means the patient has active disease, which means the patient will be treated aggressively. And you can see as we go from volume rendering to MIP, and here's MIP and volume rendering together, you recognize the amount of information we can get by simply abandoning, or maybe the word shouldn't be abandoned, but maybe it should be supplement the routine axial images with coronal, coronal, sagittal, and 3D imaging. Now, it's interesting that it's not just us who prefers, and I've spoken about this before, surgeons love coronal views. They don't want to scan through a thousand slices. Coronal views really give them a, more of a 3D perspective. Not quite 3D, but transition points and other processes are easier to appreciate in a large volume than on a single slice. And that study showed three quarters of surgeons, 76.6 percent, kind of like a Crest uh, commercial. Now, when you talk about CT, we talk about enterography that typically people refer to as a very much dedicated small bowel study. In Crohn's disease, CT enterography is terrific. Things you look at, mucosal hyperenhancement, wall thickening over three millimeters, typically at the seven to eight millimeter range, mural stratification, which means seeing bowel layers, the prominent vasa recta, the so-called comb sign, and mesenteric frat stranding. So here we see prominent vessels to the patient's right colon, this hyperemia, very classic for inflammatory condition, this case due to Crohn's disease, very nice example showing you that, 
showing you the prominent vessels is not neovascularity, but again, it's prominent vessels and prominent flow. We can see increased flow in tumors, but then you see more of neovascularity. Here it's very symmetric. You've got to be thinking of some sort of inflammatory process. We talk about the transition point. So here's an example of bowel with an enterolith present. The bowel loop's dilated, but when you look at the coronal view, you have a better understanding because now you see the enterolith, the large calcification, and the stricture in the patient's small bowel. So again, the ability to see specific points like strictures is best in a coronal type perspective. And when you go from coronal to 3D volume rendering, it's particularly ideal. In these cases, you see the hyperenhancement of the mucosa, you see the stricture, all critical findings in the management of this patient. And when you have complications, you can have psoas abscesses, rim enhancement, as in this case, and nicely shown on the coronal view. So whether you're going to manage it conservatively with peripheral drainage perhaps versus surgery, it really is good to know the extent of the process. Or this patient with Crohn's disease, look at this dilated small bowel. We know we're dealing with obstruction. We follow the bowel loops downward, and we follow it down to the right lower quadrant where there's this obvious transition point. Now the thing is, this is not very bulky. Every day of the week, I would say this is an inflammatory process. It's just a stricture. The bowel is dilated proximal to it. But when the patient was operated on, this ended up being a carcinoma arising within a loop of Crohn's disease. So you're not always going to be right. Sometimes you will be wrong. But the transition point and the cause are very easy to show. And there's articles about Crohn's and with CT enterography. This article by Elise talks about its value. Uh, in this article by Parati, we talk about the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization defines CT enterography as the imaging modality with the highest accuracy for the detection of intestinal involvement and assessment of activity. Um, so it's, it really does work very nicely. So again, in patients who are young, patients who are getting multiple CTs, perhaps you want to get some CTs, particularly if patients are going to surgery, and then also get some MRs at different time points so you could decrease the radiation dose by kind of moving back and forth between those two studies. Now, I showed you an example of bowel obstruction, and small bowel obstruction is very important. It continues to be a substantial cause of morbidity and mortality. Up to 16% of hospital admissions for acute abdominal pain are due to small bowel obstruction. Most patients are treated successfully without aggressive management. But in the wrong patient, non-surgical management can be deadly, high morbidity, high mortality. And this is especially true if you're dealing with an older person. You want to be very careful you're not missing inflammatory bowel disease, uh, but more importantly, that you're not missing ischemic bowel disease. And it's very important to realize that sometimes the findings are subtle. Unless you're thinking about them sometimes, you're not going to make the diagnosis. So it's very important to consider those possibilities. This article by Paul Sitton, MDCT, has been proven to be the single best imaging tool for evaluating suspected uh, pa patients suspected of having SBO, high sensitivity, high specificity, also for complications. So if I asked you small bowel obstruction, what's the common cause? Well, it used to be hernias way back when, nearly 100 years ago. Now it's adhesions. And in fact, when you go by the number, 70% of bowel obstructions are due to adhesions. And even though you might think if I do laparoscopic surgery is less invasive, I'm going to have less adhesions, well, not exactly the case because adhesions still occur at the surgical sites. And laparoscopic surgery with the multiple trocars, actually that becomes a good source of uh, adhesions in the future. So with small bowel obstruction, the question is why? What's the cause of the obstruction? So we're going to look for that. But we're also going to take a step back and say, well, does the patient really have bowel obstruction? If the patient has abdominal pain. It could be bowel obstruction. It could be pancreatitis. It could be stone disease. It could be almost anything. If the patient has a bowel obstruction, is it partial or complete? If the patient has a bowel obstruction, can we determine its cause, as we mentioned a moment ago? And probably from a triage perspective, 
what's the bottom line? Is this patient going home? Is the patient being admitted? Or is this patient going to surgery? What is going to happen? And I think that becomes not the easiest of questions, but it's where CT is indeed very strong. Now, if we look at bowel loops, small bowel loops over 2.5 centimeters are felt to be dilated. We talk about a feces sign where you see air bubbles and intestinal content proximal to the site of small bowel obstruction. Again, not always a perfect sign, but one of my favorite signs when you see it. We talk about small bowel wall thickening. Wall thickening is over three to four millimeters. And we talk about transition sides, sites. And one of the things we always speak about in CT when looking at bowel, if you see dilated bowel, look when it changes. At the transition point, is there a mass like a carcinoma there? Is it into a hernia? Is it into adhesions? What the heck is going on? And that's something that CT is very good at doing. So in this case, you see the dilated bowel and then you see the feces sign. Look at that large loop. Looks like it has feces. And then if you go to the end of the loop in the right upper quadrant, you can see that there's a transition point over there. You don't see a mass, but you see the transition point, and I'll show it to you with a few different images and perspectives, and you can see the transition point. You can see with volume rendering, you can see it with MIP, and you could put circles around it. There's no mass there, and that's a classic appearance of adhesions. This patient 20 years earlier had an appendectomy, and when the surgeon went in, all they found was one adhesion coming across. But all you need is one adhesion. And so when people talk about laparoscopic surgery, I think it is great short term, surely. But, you know, laparoscopic surgery does not mean no adhesions. And with multiple trocars, we may see more adhesions in the future. Now, when you're looking at obstruction, you can often see the cause. This was suspected bowel obstruction, and you could see the patient has, see the circle, a uh, mass in the tail of the pancreas that was not known. This patient's small bowel obstruction and gastric outlet obstruction, which was the presumed diagnosis, is actually due to a carcinoma of the tail of the pancreas, which is obstructing the small bowel by the ligament of trites. Very nice example. Or this case, look at these dilated loops in the left upper quadrant and look at the ascites around the loops, but nowhere else. Also, the bowel is dilated and thickened, but it seems to be pushed. And the rest of the bowel is not dilated. Do I see a mass? Do I see obstruction? Look at the thickening of the small bowel folds and look at it on the coronal view. But in the coronal view, you also see ascites around the bowel loops. When I see dilated bowel with ascites, I'm always thinking about ischemia. And I'm worried about ischemia here. And it almost looks like there's a twist in the bowel. Well, when you look at the bowel carefully and you um, really analyze it, and you look at the vessels carefully, you reach several conclusions. One is the bowel is hooked up into this left upper quadrant. It's an internal hernia. The bowel is dilated. There's ascites present, which makes me concerned about ischemia, as I mentioned, but also there's edema of the bowel. This is an internal hernia. This is a surgical emergency, and look how thick the bowel is and the lack of enhancement. And this is what we typically think about with a closed loop obstruction, specific type of obstruction in which two points along the course of a bowel are obstructed at a single location, thus forming a closed loop. Usually this is due to adhesions, a twist of the mesentery, or internal herniation. When you talk about closed loop obstruction, causes most common adhesive band or internal or external hernia. Also closed loop obstruction can lead to a volvulus. Uh, it can lead to impairment of venous outflow, which is then followed by arterial ischemia. When you talk about the uh, closed loop obstructions, we really do think about the possibilities every time we look at the bowel because this becomes a surgical emergency. Uh, article by Thompson and Paulson again make the point CT findings closed loop obstruction depend on the orientation and location. If there's lupus within the plane of imaging, the lesion often appears as a U, a C, or coffee bean configura configuration, as was the case in our case. And that important thing about that C or U-shaped distended bowel is really classic for allowing you to make the diagnosis. And I'll show you a recent case. Here the bowel is dilated and it looks like a feces sign. And when you track downward, there's a little bit of fluid. There it is right there.
Well, this was a patient with an internal hernia. And when you look at signs of ischemia, I really worry when I see fluid in the mesentery or peritoneal cavity. Although there are many benign reasons for fluid, if the patient doesn't have cirrhosis and doesn't have a lot of fluid in the abdomen previously, you gotta think about something else. And one of the signs of ischemia is going to be fluid in mesentery or peritoneal cavity. And you can see that the sequence of things that happen with ischemia, bowel wall thickening over 3CM, mesenteric edemia, then you see fluid in the mesentery, peritoneal cavity, hyperenhancement of the bowel, common occlusion of mesenteric vessels, engorged mesenteric veins, and the world sign. And then, of course, if you continue down that pathway, when things get bad and you have ischemia and you go toward infarction, you have pneumatosis, mesenteric venous gas, and, of course, portal venous gas. And if you look back at this last case, but I show it to you in coronal, look at the appearance here. You can see what looks like a coffee bean configuration to the right lower quadrant, which I said was going to be an internal hernia. Here you see the loops of bowel, and here's a schematic nicely showing you the closed loop with the dilated proximal loop and distal uh, bowel loop being decompressed. And look how beautiful it shows in this example. Coffee bean configuration. Just a very nice example of that process. Now, when you look at this, you know, you want to be able to do things interactively. And so, you know, as I have mentioned before, if you look at this case and you scroll through it, it kind of looks somewhat perhaps impressive. Where, why are the bowel loops dilated proximally? And when you look at the coronal views, you really do appreciate the bowel. And you see the bowel in the right lower quadrant. And now you see the C. You see the ascites near the C. That's an internal hernia with closed loop obstruction. This patient went to surgery. Some of the bowel path that was resected was ischemic, but the patient subsequently did fine. So again, looking at things beyond the axial plane becomes critical, and particularly as you look at complex anatomy and transition points, <coughs> transition points are best seen when you can follow the bowel and look for the cause, and here we see the cause. And with that, let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll come right back. Thanks a lot.